about, about work life harmony. Yeah. Well, it's whatever you want for yourself. Right. It's on some, some spectrum. So whatever brings joy and happiness to your heart. And if you, you're all about your career and it's 89% work and 10% play and it makes you happy, go for it. Yeah. Right. It's a, it's all about sustainability and can you keep going and going and going with it wherever you put yourself in that spectrum at that point in your life. It's making me want to light a candle. I, I think, saw oh, on your that's website. why I'm a life coach. <laughs> well, I saw on your, uh, <laughs> your bios. Welcome to the Small Business Safari, where I help guide you to avoid those traps, pitfalls, and dangers that lurk when navigating the wild world of small business ownership. I'll share those gold nuggets of information and invite guests to help accelerate your ascent up that mountaintop of success. It's a jungle out there, and I want to help you traverse through the levels of owning your own business that can get you bogged down and distract you from achieving your own personal and professional goals. So strap in, Adventure Team, and let's take a ride through the safari and get you to the mountaintop. Alan, yeah. Andy, this is exciting, and we've got to start every episode with cheers. 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 What, are, what are we drinking, Chris? Today, we're drinking a 1792 bourbon with a Stella Chaser. Mm -hmm. And if everybody's lucky and sticks to this podcast, we may be bringing in Uncle Jack later. Oh, Uncle, boy. Uncle Jack is in the room. Now we're in trouble. And that's why Andy said, I got to come in person. I'm like, yeah, because yeah, you yeah, can't yeah, drink yeah. over Zoom. No. Well, you I, can't. I, I, just... don't, I don't do things not in person with you. I've, I've come to learn that. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to the episode. This is Andy McDowell. Uh, he is Generate Your Value. I've been on his podcast. He's a great friend of mine, great business coach here in the Atlanta area. And I said, hey, can you come on to our podcast? And he said, yes. And I said, as we said earlier, you got to come in person. You and really said, well, you have you, drinking. You twisted his arm. No, I, my, my fingers are crossed behind my back when I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> then he had to ply you with booze. That's how Chris works. Uh, I did. Yeah. No, he, he doesn't have to do that with me. It's yeah. just like, it's a given. So I went on his podcast. And he says, uh, you're going to drink bourbon, right? I'm like, well, okay. hell yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So off we go. And we said, let's go ahead and get this thing recording because we're already dropping into the good stuff. Well, you were talking about what you were making your daughter for dinner. So let's go with inspirational quotes for my daughter. Uh, mm -hmm. This has nothing to do with business, but everything to do with what you raise an independent, strong-willed young lady, which I have, and I'm very proud of her, and she's doing great. Uh, but she has moved back in with us uh, after college while she works up her hours so she can go back and become a PA. She listened to this? She, they would never listen to this. Okay. So, so it's even better. You're, you're clear for takeoff. Yeah. So here we go. go and we're going to be clear. So she's for following house rules, of course. Right. Right. So she, she follows house rules. All right. She has a great bed and breakfast set up, but let me take <laughs> you through some of the quotes I get from her. So I call them inspirational quotes from my daughter, from my daughter, dad, what's for dinner? Me leftovers, her do better. <laughs> I said, no, oh. wait a minute. Was that voice or text? Those are all texts. Those are all texts. Really? Right. Upstairs, right? Like she Text could, maybe she could help make dinner, right? <laughs> okay. So yeah. check this out. Okay. I said, yeah. I said, next time, you know, this is another night. <clears throat> Dad, what's for dinner? I'm thinking about making chicken piccata. Great. My favorite. Would you like to help me? No, I'm a working girl. I'm very tired. <laughs> and you're just <laughs> sitting by the pool all day, yeah, I guess. You're just... <laughs> Let, let me continue. It gets better. <laughs> Dad, I can pick something up from Publix at the grocery store on the way home. What do you want? Oh, good, Sid. I need 15 things. I sent the list. She went, too bad, too many things. <laughs> oh, that's just going to charge you per item. Yeah. No, yeah, I charge I charge three dollars per item. Yeah, know? no, she wouldn't even pick them all up. Yeah. Oh. She didn't pick up anything. A maximum of three items for dad. <laughs> <laughs> At best. And they better be in the yeah. same part I, of the story. I, I can, uh, I can conquer this up. list in five days because it's three three items per day, right? <laughs> Yeah, it, it's so <laughs> one night at dinner, I did. Uh, I asked her, I said, hey, can you help me clean up after dinner? And she said, no, I have to go upstairs. My Netflix show is calling. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> Netflix is not a timer. No, right. You can go anytime you want. What right. are you doing? It's Apparently on it was, demand. It's calling. She said, but it's calling. I'm like, fine. 
So I love my strong-willed independent daughter, but I can't wait for that guy to come in the house that she brings in and I get a chance to meet him because I'm going to sit him down and say, <laughs> you think I'm going to be tough on you, brother? You got no idea what you're in for. You're saving all these, right? So you can show it to him when you walk. You know, this is what you're, you know, this is this, this, this is, is what you're walking into. This is what you're walking into. The uh, book has been open. So take a look because. It's a deep, hard cutting book. I think you already got your speech for the groom's dinner down. <laughs> I actually, I'm, I'm pretty sure be between then and now, uh, we are going to uh, have more. I don't know. I think he's going to have a ton of material during the wedding planning. Hmm? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That and between he her use. and her mother on this wedding. I, I don't know. They, they batted it around a little bit. And uh, she said she didn't want to have a big wedding. And when I asked, well, what does that mean? She goes, you know, nothing more than like 100,000 total spent. Uh, <laughs> uh, Normally when you talk uh, about big, you're talking about numbers of people, right? Yeah. She's already got a budget. Yeah. She's already got a budget. And that budget, uh, I don't know who, who she thinks we are, but that's a lot of money, man. That's, a, that's not a big wedding. That's a wedding, a divorce, and another wedding. Not in the South. <laughs> South, you're supposed to mortgage your house for the wedding, I think is. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So is she engaged? She is not. In fact, okay. right now, no suitors because she wants to get through school. Okay. I couldn't, I couldn't tell from your comment whether it was on the horizon or not. No, it's not uh, right now. Not imminent, but it uh, has been talked about. And like I said, I love having her home and doing this. And it's been great because she, she, is, a, she is actually a, a great hang. She's a fun daughter. Uh, she does make, make our lives more fun. And it's nice having your adult daughter come home for a little while, knowing that you, you're getting some uh, days and weeks with her that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Yeah. But that being said, there have been a lot of those chuckles. And what does that have to do with business? Not yeah, this is a, you know, work-life balance. Mm -hmm. As we learned in another episode, harmony, That's no right. such thing as work-life balance. And I know actually Andy and I have talked about that whole phrase before about work-life balance. Yep. And I'd love to have you share a little bit about what you think that whole phrase means and what it should mean. And then we'll start riffing on some other fun things about my daughter. <laughs> about, about work-life harmony. Yeah. Well, it's whatever you want for yourself, right? It's on some, some spectrum. It's whatever brings joy and happiness to your heart. And if you, you're all about your career and 89% work and 10% play and it makes you happy, go for it. Yeah. Right. It's a, it's all about sustainability and can you keep going and going and going with it, wherever you put yourself in that spectrum at that point in your life. It's making me want to light a candle. I, I think, saw oh, on your that's website. why I'm a life coach. <laughs> well, I saw in your, uh, your bio, since I don't have the relationship that mm -hmm. you guys have. So I'm like, okay, he did something at the airport in Beijing aerospace mm -hmm. and then spiritual awareness. Mm -hmm. I think is what you wrote. You, like you, didn't you write that? It's on your. I don't know if it's in my bio or not. It is. It's okay. It's something that you said you have. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm sorry. I've cultivated over the years. Curious about that. How it relates to business. I'm check. I'm fact checking right now, which I'm famous. Look for. towards the bottom. Well, it's not on that one. It was on his website. It's really. It's, it's really down to what drives your why in life. And you help people find their why? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've developed some. Uh, so my strength in business was business strategy. And uh, so I've taken some business strategy tools and tweaked them for a life strategy. And it depends on whether the person th themselves is spiritual or not. You don't have to be spiritual to sort of have a purpose in life. What drives you, makes you happy. How did you go from... Is aerospace, right? Well, let's talk about that because see, uh, he was. See, you already have an agenda, and you didn't tell me what. No, it's no way because I like surprising the shit out of you. Yeah. So thanks. Uh, so you, I was waiting to see you know, how much further you're going to go with the spiritual thing because I think he's got great everybody points on it. in the room except for me knows what's going on. <laughs> it's really, it's really a fun place to be. It is yeah. more fun. I'm glad I have this. It's a really nice bottle of 1792. Don't worry, we're breaking. I mean, into we, the jack, we are so. being spiritual here. <laughs> We each have together. a bourbon in our hands. We're being spiritual. I think it's evil spirits. <laughs> evil when, spirits. When, when you're no. toying with me like this. No, <laughs> I didn't mean to toy with you. All right. Uh, so um, as, 
uh, as many people may not know this on the podcast, I have a huge affinity for aerospace. You know, I started in the uh, manufacturing aerospace mm-hmm. parts screws. for the Boeing. Uh, so I went from screws. I went to actually flap actuators at Curtis Wright Flight Systems. So I made what make your flaps work on 767s. Mm-hmm. So if you're listening to this on a 767 right now, um, you better put on your uh, parachute real quick because I'm not sure it's going to land. You know, I actually uh, had a, <laughs> I was on one of those flying into denver and the flaps didn't work there's no way not with my gears baby my yeah, gears no, spot that, on. and you know the air is kind of thin there's not a lot of resistance but right. the runways thank god are like eight miles long or yes. something like that so yes we used them all thanks chris okay, well you're welcome particularly yeah. the uh, westernmost the north south runway on the west side of the airport is really long. long yeah i so, was i was appreciative of that. <clears throat> did you have anything to do with that um, I had everything to do with the current airspace structure of Denver. How about that? So you just played right into his hand, my Ooh, friend. I know. And I it did is. it completely ignorantly. No, you're not supposed <clears throat> to say to that. You. You're supposed to make it sound like you just you flowed right into it. No, I already established I, sh- I should really say I have everything to do with the roots, you know, the starting point of airspace. I'm sure the FAA has done slight modifications since, but. My team brought what's called RMP, Required Navigational Performance, to to Denver, and it was used as a model by the FAA for the rest of the country. So let's back that up. He's the one who designed the airport that you fly into so that planes can land without hitting each other and stop without falling off the face of the earth. That's what oh, he did. Oh, yeah. That's pretty big stuff. Yeah. And not only did he do it for like regular old, hey, airports, we're just going to do them. But he did it in a hurried pinch for the Sochi and Beijing Olympics. Mm -hmm. And uh, listening to his story and how he had to do it that quickly and come up with this whole design and how they're going to get a massive amount of planes in and out of this place quickly, fascinating. And so with that lead in. Yeah, we enabled Beijing Airport to become the second busiest in the world behind Atlanta. By the work we did, they, they added a second control tower and a third runway, and we did all the airspace work ground movement stuff everything for the olympics and you know the olympics brings a ton of airplanes in for a short period of time two weeks three weeks and having that kind of pressure you know that, that pressure point on operations if you can make that consistent a lot of deviations then you can have a huge operation in the airport that's what they managed to do so the first day you got that call, said so Andy, it's um, Beijing. We're gonna, we're, we're, yeah, we're, you're gonna have to build an airport, and it's gonna be in Beijing, and um, you you can't miss the deadline, big guy, because it's the Olympics, right? When you, when you got that call the first time, and they said, I know you've been doing work on airports, and, and you have a deadline that could be spongy. Well, what happened? So the second biggest market for airplanes for Boeing is China, so they give a lot of free free services to the Chinese he's, he's government massive air quotes massive. Yeah, massive air quotes you know free free services to <laughs> the government side in China to enable you know the infrastructure to be able to handle a whole lot more airplanes so they can then go sell a large number of airplanes to the, to all their airlines so that's the phone call to Andy and say um you know we've got up to a $5 million budget for you to take a year and a half to two years to go in and help the Chinese get their airport ready for the Olympics. And Oh, by the way, you have no fluctuation in time because we're coming to you last minute. Oh, really? You know, I mean, oh, a year and a half, really... two years being last minute. Yeah. So it was a scramble, scramble, scramble. And then for the Chinese culture, nothing gets done unless you're there. So you go over for a week or two and you work side by side with them and you'd say, okay, now you need to go A, B, C, D, E, and F and do that before we come back next time. And you come back next time and you're lucky if A, B, and C were done, <laughs> you know, cause they, they, they only, they only do things when you're sitting by their side as a, as a coach or a fallback, you know, like we're not real comfortable with doing this on our own because it's all new things. And, and Oh, by the way, we, for some reason can't pick up the phone and call you while you're still back in Atlanta and talk about these things before we arrive. So when you, 
you have a, you have an agenda for your week long visit or whatever. And all of a sudden you got to cram twice as much stuff into that one week because they didn't do their end of the. Is that a cultural thing that you <clears throat> ran into? Is that a, do you think that's a Chinese cultural thing or that just happened to be the group you had to work well, with? It's a little bit culture. It, it, this will blow your socks off. Um, so our very first, very first trip there uh, is always a big data gathering trip for us, no matter who the customer is. You know, we want to, know the exact location of your runways, your navigational aids, where your military airports, where your civil airports are in the area, because we've got to avoid their traffic with whatever way we bring in your traffic. You know, it's a big data. You know, it's a whole week of, okay, we need this. What do you got? And they bring out their papers and whatnot. Okay, that's good. That's good. No, that's not good. You've got something more detailed. You know, it's that kind of conversation. So we sat down with the Chinese and we're asking, okay, where's your... Um, military airports oh that's in, probably in their not a popular question in, in their training areas right so this is a civil side in in a country of china the military owns the airspace right they they say what goes in the airspace in, in our country it's a civil side and and the pentagon works with the faa to carve out training areas and when they're active and not active and it's very highly coordinated not in china and they're like well, i'm sorry we can't tell you Listen, I have to do it blind. <clears throat> so literally, yeah, it's like, it was okay, the so Chinese secret. we're going to we're going to design some, you know, some approach and departure routes for you and just hope, hope that they're, they, <laughs> they don't fly over the top of a military airport. How are we going to get that? You know, whether that's a go, go or no go for you. Oh, just send us, send it to you and we'll tell you. Uh, we'll works. tell you. Oh, my God. So we went back home. Shoot one down. We went back home and started Googling. Just seeing what was out there on the internet just to get some kind of guidance. And we plotted all these things on a map. Went out there, you know, on our second trip and we threw it on the table <laughs> and eyes were bulging out of their heads, mouth were drop feeds, and like, where did you get this information? We said we Googled it. It's just, it's just free information Googled readily Earth. available, <laughs> readily available out on the internet. And after that the the spigot just opened up wide because they they the civil side now had an excuse with the military side to say you know if they ever came into question it's like they found it on the internet we didn't give it to them so that helped we just they just needed that excuse in front of the in front of the military and all of a sudden the spigot just opened we got all the data they even went on one of our trips we need uh exact lat long coordinates on some of their runway ends they said, okay, bring your, bring your GPS device with you. They took two of my team members in a, in a car with the yellow lights and drove out. This is in, in peak departure demand time at the airport. They drove out there, called the tower and said, close the runway for five minutes. So we got planes lined up on the taxiway for takeoff they're like 15 deep and everybody else is circling. and there's there's my two guys standing on the end of the runway with his gps device <laughs> take you know you, you know you have to let the signal settle for a little bit to get really high accurate coordinates so we're just down there five minutes and you, you can see the eyeballs on the in the cockpit it's probably speaking in chinese going wtf what the yeah <laughs> And I can, heck is I can, going on here. We got to take off. We got two gringos <laughs> standing yeah, out on the right. I, I can hear it. Take a hey, GPS. Hey, Ted, no, move over two feet. <laughs> right, no, move, move up one foot. Okay. Almost. Okay. All right. Read that to me. <sighs> what well, was that? A one? What was that? A two? Will you just give me the damn number? <laughs> I, I forgot my glasses. <laughs> Darnest thing I've ever seen. Hold, hold, holding up, holding up. Peak demand air traffic 15 airplanes stuck in a queue on a tax week. Can you all of them going, today? what the hell is going on? You imagine that today? You know, at least two of those planes will be taxing back to the uh, airport terminal because two unruly passengers got into a huge fist fight because they were sitting out there going, can you believe these two clowns are sitting at the end of the <laughs> runway with a stupid <laughs> GPS going back and forth talking to each other? And this thing, absolute mayhem. So literally, those guys wouldn't tell you where this stuff was. So nope. I got to use this dad pun too. So you oh, I love you a good dad joke. Ready? Yeah. So you were going to be flying blind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Take that, Sydney. <laughs> Do better. Do, Do better. better. Do better. Do better. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. So you, I, I love, I mean, this is, this is the kind of stuff when you talk so, about working overseas. What's the world Here's another you? story. Oh, Here's oh, another sorry. story for you. So we're, 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 we're in a meeting. We, uh, we go into the control tower to have a meeting and they put us into a <clears throat> meeting room. And I had a gentleman on my team. It was, it was about my size, a little bit, a little bit bigger. For those of uh, us on the podcast, um, Alan is very tall and skinny, yeah. and and Andy and I are are, are, are not as skinny as Alan. Right. Do better, Chris. So, <laughs> Chris, do, this do, gentleman. Do better. This gentleman. You so, so you have to remember, uh, furniture and so forth is designed for the average Chinese person, right? Oh. So it gets in the big guy little it, chair. It, exactly, <laughs> he sits down in the chair and he. And he leans back with just a little bit of pressure, you know, just sort of relax as people are gathering before we start the meeting. And whoo, the whole chair breaks. Oh my God. <laughs> flat on his back. And you know, in Chinese, they're all saying, the fat man broke my chair. He's supposed to be the expert, and he is a doofus. Well, in, 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 <laughs> the, they, the, the thing is, with heavy set people in their culture, we'd be, you know, after work, we're out of our hotel looking to go eat somewhere, or we're walking down the sidewalk and you'd have Chinese, particularly younger adults, they'd come be coming running up to him. They'd be putting putting their hands on his belly and for luck. No way. For luck. Well they because actually would touch you. Yeah, because people over there, if if you're that heavy set, that means you have enough money to be able to eat as much food as you want. It was for luck. Right. So it's a sign of wealth over in that culture, you know. Well, from that perspective, you look pretty poor in this weird. room, big boy. And you know, and I are we had pretty we fat, had, we, if you know what I mean. You know, we had some in in our culture. We had other guys in our group that would probably be considered more handsome from that perspective. And they couldn't get the time of day in that culture. It was always always somebody walking around with a with a nice food or beer belly or whatever, wow. you know, because in, in their culture, they were the wealthy ones. That is. Again, when you when you do this stuff and you get to experience the cultural differences, that is just you know it's 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 always interesting. I mean, that's why you love traveling, and doing this. All right, we got to get back on this timeline because all right, I love the pressure because mm-hmm. I still think it's amazing uh, how you're able to pull this all off, given all the obstacles you're. So you guys go back and forth. The the well, the Russia go, one was even worse. Which one? The Russia one. So just to put it in perspective, you're taking how many flights a day and then coming up with plans for you're about uh, close to doubling the operations and and you're having to deal with um, a lot higher percentage of business aviation you know all the muckety mucks yeah where their money you're wanting to come in and so parking space is at a premium and that was that was the issue in sochi so it's logistics in the air and on the ground on and on the ground and ground movements because you're you're almost literally doubling air traffic, particularly at the very beginning and the very end when everybody's coming in for the opening and closing ceremonies and all the diplomats and everything. It's it's a nightmare. All right. So you pull Beijing off. So you figured next time they said, hey, Sochi, you're like, no problem. I got this communist country. I got you. Oh, no, love, they love. Me. It's even worse. The commies love the me. commies <laughs> love me. I pulled this shit off. I did it on a five million dollar budget, came in on time. They love me. I get to do it again. And at that All point, right. the, the CIA yeah. said, hey. <laughs> hey, I don't you, know how many times I people make jokes at me like, well, we really know you're a CIA spy. Right. Spending all this time in China and Russia. And it's so a where are your you know, have you got vessels? Have you gotten your apartment in Moscow yet? Yeah. You know, type comments. Yeah. All right. So let's skip forward then to Sochi because <clears throat> uh, I uh, what made Sochi so much harder? Um, only two runways. So for those that don't know, Sochi is at the very southern end of Russia on the Black Sea. It's a resort town, right? It's a resort town. It's, uh, you know, palm trees. Not many places in the whole country of Russia you find palm trees. Mm -hmm. And it's, I don't know, 10 miles from the country of Georgia. So it's right at the very bottom of the country. And and Putin, Putin grew up in excuse me, St. Petersburg, but he has a, a dacha down in that neck of the woods. And so he was, he's proud of the area. And 
wanted Russia to host the Olympics and wanted to do it in that part of the country. So it's a lot like California from the sense that you have coastline, palm trees, and then only a short distance away from the Black Sea with elevation and you've got mountains that can handle snow. And that was the challenge for the Sochi airport was the runways were east-west. They were in the shape of a V. And there was no ability because the mountains were so close to the easternmost end, runway ends to land or take off aircraft in that direction. So in normal operations, they're shutting departures down for a short period of time, let a bunch of airplanes land. And then the, what doesn't get in puts, gets put in a five-minute holding pattern while they launch a bunch of aircraft right, so in the same uncertainty. direction over the sea. You said Beijing became the second biggest airport. And just so just for scale, we know here in Atlanta, we feel like we have the number one airport in the world. We do in flight operate number of takeoff and landings. How many, how many, how many runways do we have in Atlanta? Five. We have five. They have two in two. Sochi. Yep. Okay. All right. And they're in a V. And little parking space. And no parking space because there's too many mountains and sea in the way. Well, the airport's just not big. So they had to go and uh, they had to utilize other airports along the coast of the Black Sea for parking. So people come in, land, offload their passengers, and then go back to the runway, take off and fly, I don't know, 30, 50, 60 miles up the coast, land at another airport and park. <laughs> Off-site parking. How about that? So, yeah. it's a, so that's just wow. like us, right? When you go to the airport, I know. you go to off-site parking, you shuttle in, and mm-hmm. you get on your airplane. They yeah, bring the exactly planes like in, and you have to offload them out. So not yeah. only are they coming in, you're like, um, yeah, you guys got 15 minutes, so I could make that happen. Okay, you got to go. Bye. See you later. Go somewhere else. Holy. Which only which only exasperates the whole, you know, runway operations when you got yeah planes coming in that, you know, within a half hour are going to have to so use you, it again. You weren't allowed to use. You, you couldn't build any more runways because you had no time. There's no space. There's no, no space. time. So the, everything you had to do is all about logistics. Yeah. Well, we. We have our own proprietary um, flight and ground simulation tool that we have had for a number of years. We heavily use that to look at all kinds of different scenarios from ground movement, uh, takeoff landings, trying to find the best solution for them. All right. So you work out all those solutions. Here, here's a question for you, because I, I'm dying to know this one. So you, you do it all and you say, okay, here come the Americans. Here comes... Um, public airplanes, uh, domestic airplanes, whatever they're called over there. Then there's the diplomats, the people who mm-hmm. are somebody. Yep. They get priority and they're like, you know, you know, I know you guys had a plan, but screw that plan. I'm coming in. No, they had to get they had to right all, in the mix. Everybody had to be You might have been able to do that in Beijing because you've got so much more capacity, but. Not in Sochi. <laughs> they, they worked with Aeroflot and all the other airlines coming out of Moscow because Sochi was not an airport that had a lot of international flights, meaning they were coming from Turkey or Greece or somebody else nearby. A lot of air traffic for Sochi comes out of St. Petersburg or Moscow, one of the big major internal. international hubs. So they, they worked with the airlines extensively on scheduling to have a good steady flow and not this mass. Everybody wants access to the airport at the same time. So they sort of had to take the regular schedule and, throw it out the window and was there going to be the size? schedule over the next two weeks, you know, for you as an airline, was there a plane size limit? Like you, yes. You, so you couldn't, you couldn't fly a triple seven in there. Really? Not even a triple seven. I don't think you could. Could you guys get an airline? It'd be like a seven, six, seven. seven, eight, seven kind of size or smaller, but based off the runway length, it's industry terms, Alan. I don't expect you to you're, understand. Yeah. You're kind of a big deal, Chris. You know what? And that's uh, that's me pulling like 20 years ago, <laughs> and I'm lying. 25. <laughs> so, but, but you, going were, back, going back to Putin, um, he had to call all of his oligarch friends in the room and said, "Hey, I want to put the Olympics in Sochi, and we're going to have to build a ton of stuff because we don't have a lot of Olympic style infrastructure in the place." So he he said, you're going to do that for Mother Russia. And so a lot of the oligarchs had to either provide actual services or, or a lot of rubles to 
to do this mass build out and mass and, and they weren't out. done by the time the olympics started i know no that. remember no yeah the the athletes were staying in dorms that mm. were you know just yep. like barely put together and some of the venues were barely put together wow yeah, no, i stayed I in a before. brand new when we were working there i stayed in a brand new hotel that was right in the village area where all the athletes so i got to sit there at you know many trips that i went in to associate you know, staying out on my balcony in my room and just watch the build out of all these so what buildings so, for the for the athletes once you develop the plan then the olympics happen mm -hmm. are, you, are you on site the entire olympics just no i can't see? tell you how many times i offered to to volunteer for work in the air traffic control tower during the olympics but nah. so nah. you weren't there during the olympics nope. at all nope. really nope. so wow. you, you gave them the plan which we all know you know the the seconds the the you know the, <laughs> the first bullet flies the plan goes out the window and it's up to them to execute what you delivered yeah. Yeah. So you were not on call, not on set, oh, not at an escalation. Uh, I offered left and right, but in both cases, they said no. Yeah. How about that? Here I thought, uh, you know, what's interesting is uh, I, a similar story. So in NASCAR, I'm going to bring this all back to NASCAR. Why? Because I'm going to Daytona 500 this weekend. Ooh. But, yeah, baby. Uh, but in Charlotte, I know guys who work in the, the facilities, right? They do all the car work. They do all the... Uh, uh, truck builds, they do the engine builds, they'll do the uh, yeah. skin builds. And uh, I remember when I first moved to Charlotte, I was there, I was on a Sunday and I was riding a, um, I had a mountain bike and I was out mountain biking. And this guy worked for Hendrick Motorsports. I'm like, why well, aren't you at the mm -hmm. track? He goes, mm -hmm. this is my only day off. And the last place I want to be is around a car. <laughs> I get that. Yeah. So I, I was like, either you'd be really excited to be there or, and you would have been, but they just wouldn't even let you come. Huh, that's interesting. I don't know. It's sort of like being an architect and not being allowed on the on a site to watch them build it. You know what I'm saying? It's just you want to be there at least a day or two and watch your baby actually in action, right? But but it also seems ridiculously short sighted on their part to not have you there. I agree with that. That sounds like shitty planning. So hey, Putin. Um, give me a call and I'm going to let you know how you should have done this better. I know you're busy trying to work on, you know, like invading Ukraine. You're trying to get an invitation to his Dacha in uh, yeah. Sochi. Aren't I can't you? even say it. And I want to go there. I know, and, uh, it's but like, hey, hey, Putin, just give me a call. Maybe you work on your business. I mean, you were in Vegas. Now you're going to the Daytona 500. You just name drop. Wait a minute. How did I do? Did, didn't you just listen to him about his daughter? Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't work. Just do, I, she, I don't she's, work. she's the working woman. He's not. I do better. All do I do better, is kick Chris. around, drink with you guys, and talk, <laughs> talk nonsense, make it sound like I know about business, and then sling some industry lingo every once in a while, like a six seven seven seven. That's triple seven. Hello four seven. You know why they? You know why the humps in the four seven? Because the pilot's gonna sit on his wallet. Oh, Dan oh, joke again. Oh, yeah, because they're usually the most senior pilots in the we crowd. Are. Yeah. <laughs> Those, those, uh, obviously that, that's an incredible experience to do something like that. And, um, if you, if you can't fully grasp the scale of it, listening to this, um, just think back for just a second on what he just said, two runways. Um, and Sochi was not the second busiest airport Beijing was, but Sochi mm -hmm. was up there as well. When you did what you had to do, I mean, you got him up in the top 10 busiest no. airports couldn't no. because they couldn't do it. No, couldn't not, not. It's akin to what happens um, that those that are fortunate enough to go skiing into Aspen and, and fly into the Aspen airport, it's the same deal. The, the airport is deep in a valley surrounded by mountains on three sides. And they have to do the same thing. They have to clear the airspace for a few departures, and then they turn around and stop departures for a little bit and allow planes to come in for an arrival. So it's the exact same setup. Such an interesting space you've been in. And Alan's looking at me, and just the answer is no. I have not been to Aspen, <laughs> but I was in Durango you know, last year. Like, why Hello. did you write that down, Chris? Uh, oh, I can, and, and oh, by the way, we've done work at Aspen too. Nice. You know what? He, uh, Aspen's on my list. He's one of these guys that makes me feel like I maybe wasted my life a little bit. <laughs> well, uh, he's it's a pretty interesting life. I mean, he obviously he's seen a lot yeah, of the world I've because going Korea. to China, yeah. watching this. Watching his coworker get his belly rubbed, going to Sochi. Yeah, rubbing one of the coolest things, though, was helping the Chinese open a brand new airport in Tibet. That was cool. Oh, see, so, you know, there's 
a whole nother thing. Tibet. All right. Is there a big, Let's keep going, is there man. A big demand of flying into Tibet? No, but just a <laughs> just a technical challenge that had to had to happen was impressive. What we did. That's where we truly brought. I, I mentioned this technology R and P. The only way you could get in and out of this airport was using that technology. That the Chinese actually tried to do it the traditional ways, and so. Um, so for somebody like me. Mm -hmm. who does not have his master's degree in making screws like Chris, what does that mean? What is a normal versus what you had to do for Tibet? So prior to GPS, you know, for 50, 60 years prior to that, navigation was done using electronic devices on the ground to provide navigational assistance, right? So airplanes used to fly like sailboats. You know, sailboats have to tack. Right to get where they're going because of the wind. So it's more of a zigzag pattern. Um, aircraft used to have to fly that because they'd fly from one navigational aid to another. It was never a perfectly straight line until GPS came along. I didn't know that. That's, I didn't either. That's really cool. That's cool. So, See, gold nuggets here. It might not be about business, but check that out. I, I can't tack. wait to hear how he must have no patience for some business owner who isn't organized or you know doesn't want to get organized i don't know he seems well, i don't know man i've known him for a while he's a pretty patient dude the, the other guy sitting in the room here eh, he's not so patient but that might be me okay all right back to <laughs> tibet so they tacked I, I, this is fascinating it right. is so all the uh, FAAs, if you will, of the world have aircraft that are tasked with checking the flight procedures that are built into and out of an airport. In other words, you've got folks sitting at a table and they draw up these maps with this pathway into the airport, so to speak. But then you actually get an aircraft, a test aircraft that goes out there and flies it to check the procedure to make sure that, yeah, they designed it as it should be. In other words, we're not going to fly into a mountain. We're not going to fly into a, a building, bad. into any electrical towers or anything of that nature, right? So they go out and actually test the thing before they let you know the public start flying them. So the Chinese, you know, they tried to use navigational aids this airport is in a river valley with mountain peaks that are 20 to twenty five thousand feet in height right next Just to for it. the listeners andy's holding his hand up yeah really so it's high. really high right it's, it looks like twenty five thousand feet it to me really so <laughs> but you're, I might be a little you're talking about off. mountains of the same caliber of a mount mckinley yeah. you know not yeah huge. ball town brass or whatever here <laughs> in, in, in you know hey that's a high in northern point, Georgia or whatever. 4,500 feet. Right, 4,500. We're talking about 24,000 feet, right? That's way up there. I get it. So you really have, you have to thread the needle down over the top of this river to get down to the airport, which sits right next to the river. And so the Chinese brought their, their test aircraft in to fly these procedures that were designed using these navigational aids that were put on the sides of the mountain oh my god right along the river what's the elevation of the river of oh, around four thousand feet oh my god so twenty one thousand so, feet drop to get yeah, into an airport right so the, the test aircraft came in and got halfway to the airport in in chinese the pilot said wtf and <laughs> we do love put it. it put it to full throttle and flew back to the airport that they were taken off from like it can't be done actually i think right so there here you spent millions of uh, yuan this is their currency um to build this airport now you have this this test pilot so to speak coming in going can't be done guys just at all <laughs> you know can't do it at all <laughs> not not using this kind of technology right so they brought us in to help with gps and uh, what would be called very accurate gps which is r and p and we built the procedures for them to get the aircraft in. And this is badass. I don't now wanna, all of a sudden they had a functional airport, business. right? I don't they had a functional airport. I want to talk about right. your failings as a father. 
Thank you. I don't want to, I don't want to talk about how you All solve right. the Can, world's speaking of my feelings for father. I got I got two dad jokes I'm going to insert that are coming back in. Number one, here's what the Chinese pilot said. And I'm quoting Austin Powers. <laughs> okay. Fuck me. No, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> and here's the other thing. Uh, Andy just said very accurate GPS. Mm-hmm. And then he said R and D. And R-N-P. Look, R-N-P. R-N-P. And I look at it and I look at it and it says badge. <laughs> Wouldn't it? Uh, says badge. <laughs> We just lost Chris. <laughs> we did. I have no idea he's, what he did. He's pulling his headphones I off, and he's crying. Let us cry. P.S. I'm like, oh my god, my dirty mind is. Yeah, you're off. gonna have to go on YouTube so okay. people can see. Everybody, you. Uh, we're coming back. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, uh, don't forget to tip your waiters and waitresses. Everybody yes. hang on with us. Let's get back to this because I want to yeah. figure out how you land a plane because I don't I, I want to hear how you get down 21,000 feet. Did you fix it? Yeah, totally fixed it. We not only fixed it, we gave them an ability that um, if they lose an engine, they can still get out. Really? So you have to think about stuff like that, too. Yes. How about that one? What are some other things? Because the most the about? most critical phase of flight is landing and yeah, the party. I, mean, I, I get a bit. That's one of the most. I, I get the biggest kick, right? Um, um, I'm about to do an international flight, right? So I'm at JFK and I'm getting on a seven six or a triple seven, right? And I'm in business yeah, class, go like that. And I'm sitting there in my class with the wine, champagne, yeah. and and whatnot. And I've got people all around me taking their shoes off they're you know they're putting the free socks on that they give you you know they're they're getting nice and comfy and i'm, I'm saying to myself you you're know, in crash position. i have i have too much <laughs> i have too much knowledge in my hand i'm like you don't understand the most critical phase of flight is is the first 10 minutes of flight and i'm still sitting there with my shoes on ready ready to not grab my bag and just get the f out of the out of the airplane if need be and and you guys are going to be like holy you know uh, if if this happens right i don't start i do that but it's after 10 minutes around 20 minutes of the flight and he's almost up at cruising altitude and we've passed that that phase of highest risk you know in a flight so i used to be in but i don't want to i mean i could go lecture people and i'm I'm like no i don't want to scare you i don't you know i'm already scared yeah so i used to be Uh, consulting i scared i i uh, it it happens it happens such a small percentage of the time it's only people that have the knowledge like me it's like nurses in hospitals it's like i have too much information right i don't want to i don't want to know either and (laughs) and being in aerospace like it was uh, Andy actually brought up the one thing. Every airplane has a redundant system, meaning yep. if one fails, the other one will always pick it up. Most of them do. Commercial ones. Every airplane. I don't think my brother-in-law's farm plane in Mexico had a redundant thing. No, he's it, going it had uh, duct tape. But all that being said, having his institutional knowledge, here's how I try to eradicate it. So before I get on an airplane, it's two shots. And the minute I get on the airplane, it's another three. Because <laughs> if I'm going down, I ain't feeling damn you're gonna go woo! <laughs> i'm gonna be i'm gonna be slim pickets yeah, coming that's down right. that's right <laughs> because i i uh, i've heard the same thing i've heard that from pilots i heard that as we were developing stuff is that the most important times are coming up and coming down and the most important are the first 10 minutes coming off that yeah runway. but as as airspace um designers something you design for the commercial airlines is what's called engine out procedures in that critical phase of departure and you lose an engine, you know, the whole in the Hudson thing. Yeah. Right. Sully. You get, you get birds sucked in your engine and you lose them or you lose one of them. What are you bird doing? Strike. How are you getting yeah, bird strike? How are yeah. you getting back to the airport? And so we design actual pathways that the aircraft could take to get back to the airport and land, declare an emergency, get priority in the queue and I'm never get themselves. Again. You know, you're going to fly again. But that's why it, it's, keeping it's one of the out. safest you industries just... around because we go to that level of preparation. Correct. So my, yeah. my, brother, my, my brother-in-law just... is a, a private pilot, and, mm-hmm. and he used to run a farm in Mexico. So one time I decided to go visit him, and he said, okay, well, you fly down to McAllen, Texas, and I'll pick you up, and I'll fly you down there. And I remember I'm looking out at the 
the palm trees, which are just absolutely all pointing to the left because the wind was blowing so hard. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, we, you know, we don't, we don't have to go today. I can stay another day. You know, it's like, no, that's the way it always is. It always is. I, I'm a nervous flyer. And so we're, uh, it's called prevailing winds. Yeah. Preve- so we're, we're in this little plane. I'm a tall guy. And he's like, Hey, can you not have your knee on this lever? And I'm like, okay. And then he's like, can you not have your knee on other knee on that button? And I'm like, pick one. Cause I, I mean, I'm okay. wedging. And so in three ways I can fit in the seat, right? right? And, and knowing and, how tall you are. <laughs> and, and, the, and the windshield is like a foot in front of my face. And so we take off and I'm trying to like suck my knees in. So I'm not touching a lever or a button. And this, this, this little teeny windshield is a foot in front of my face and we're flying. And I feel like I'm on a leaf. We're just bouncing around and then you can see, and then you can't see, and you can see, and you can't see because of the clouds mm-hmm. going through the clouds. Yeah. And we're just slowly getting altitude. And I'm like, so, you know, where's your navigational gear? And, you know, and he's like, yeah, it's a, it's a little farm plane. We, we don't have that. I go, how do you, how do you not hit other planes? And he goes, we like to call it the big sky theory. Yeah. No, the amount of cubic cubic volume of air. So I'm how many airplanes could fit into it. Right? And yeah. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not happy about the fact that it's windy and we're bouncing around like I'm on a leaf and I can't see half the time. And then my brother-in-law just dryly says, it's the big sky theory. Like, you know, the sky's big enough. We're probably not going to hit any. I, I could have helped dissuade your fears. fears. The three shots. I, I should have right. done the three shots. Mm-hmm. You should have done two before you got on yeah. and three when you got on. Yeah. And then here's what I would have said to you as, as your pilot, which I would never be your pilot because the last thing you ever want to do is <laughs> have you as your me. pilot. Yeah. I, cause these guys <laughs> are so cool, freaking distracted, they're calm, they're oh. collected, they're yeah. focused <laughs> and that ain't me brother. So no, there's a pile the two of you in the back of my airplane and I'll go flying you guys. <laughs> you fly me. I'm good. Uh, I guarantee you, I will never be a pilot, uh, uh, but I would have said no, I'm playing place. <laughs> no, <I'm playing> place. <laughs> would that have helped? No, I did. No, so. Nothing would have helped me at that. That's moment. why I'm not uh-huh. your pilot. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it is scary i tell you um the most worried i've ever been on an airplane was the smallest plane uh that i've ever been on the big planes have never uh worried me and and i've had to do two aborted landings and one uh it wasn't a failed takeoff but we lost an engine on takeoff and he still got up and that was good but i could i could tell it was happening uh, only because you just kind of know, mm-hmm. but those are bigger planes. It's the smaller ones that absolutely scare the living bejesus out of me. I mean, you, you, you're dropping five feet at a time. You go up five feet at a time, you're just throwing you all over the place. And you're like, Oh my God. Yes. I got a couple stories with that. Right. And, yeah. and, and these guys are, and, and these guys, these pi- and, and to me, pilots are the best. You know, I've got a good friend who's a pilot. I know how they do it. They're very cool, calm, collected. And I always make that joke. I just made it again. But they just know how to handle it. And like you said, it's the safest thing you can be on. In fact, I would, it's uh, trains and planes are safer than automobiles easily and over walking. I mean, it's crazy. So, well, I mean, it, aviation industry is one of the last ones to fully, fully incorporate a new technology. I mean, Cars that had the Garmin devices and GPS in them for, I don't know, five to 10 years before I was being asked to help bring GPS into the flight because they were, they test the heck out of it just as a, just as a basic means of navigation. Let's not even talk about where we're deciding the routes or anything yet. Let's just talk about the basic facts of navigating an aircraft by GPS and how safe is that? Yeah, that yeah, probably took 10 years just in that conversation and testing before we actually start going and developing actual routes, the highways in the sky, if you will, the planes are going to fly using GPS. I mean, so let me ask you, a, a, it's like the medical industry. They're just saying they take forever to develop technology because they're afraid of what it does for people's lives. Right. right. It's the same thing. So much testing. So let me ask you a topical current events question. 5G technology getting rolled out mm-hmm. and people using their cell phones on airplanes. 
Is it bullshit or is it truly a problem? It truly could be a problem. And so why? Because I, I truly don't know this one. Not a sudden um, I can't talk to cell phones in the plane, but I can talk about the, the latest with 5G. So in order to do 5G, the cellular companies were more specifically FCC provided frequencies, aka bandwidth, around certain frequencies for 5G to use with your phones. Those frequencies are right next to a band of frequencies that radio altimeters are used on aircraft. So they're not over the top of each other, but they're right next door. So if you get frequencies that sort of, particularly from a power perspective that bleed over, may affect radio altimeters. And where a radio altimeter comes into play is when the aircraft is coming in for a landing, it's using beams of frequency to aim towards the ground and getting a bounce back to understand how high above the ground the aircraft is. So you you may have seen some videotape or if you're a flight simulator guy, you hear this voice as they're coming in for landing, you hear 120 feet, 110, 90, 80. You know, you get this countdown of feet as the, yeah, because the, the pilots are so concentrated on the runway and keeping it straight lined and so forth. They use a voice announcement in a cockpit as the aircraft is getting close to the ground. So they know because at a certain point, you know, I don't know, pilot knows this more, but around 10, 20 feet above the runway, they do a flare where they bring the nose up to get the, the back gear down lower. So when it hits the ground, it hits the the back gear and then the front gear comes down as it starts slowing listening could see his hands i know <laughs> right. but don't worry i'm going to give you a great illustration but they need they need that kind of guidance to know wh- where they are with an exact measurement and that's what yeah. they use that radio altimeter for drives that announcement of 80 70 right. 60 you know kind of so andy gave us the very technical version mm-hmm. now i'm going to kick it old school oh die hard too baby remember when the yes. bad guy yes moved ground up yes and the altimeter came down sucks and up. bruce yes. willis comes out with the flares right not yes. flaring up the, didn't work and it he was like no no and it didn't work it didn't, it didn't work. work so 5g die hard bruce willis bad guy so you're playing angry birds 5g you're crashing your plane you're, you're crashing i feel like we're just like you need to drink so more before you get to the next play i swear to god i'm never flying again in, i'm, in, I'm in driving the, to sochi if they ever do the olympics yeah. there again in the pursuit of more technical stuff. The concern is more about the power and the bleed as opposed to the frequencies themselves. This is so goddamn interesting. I can't take it. I know it's really cool. I, it, Chris right? and I are just sitting here with our mouths <laughs> wide open. No, I mean he's got so much, uh, so much knowledge around the space, which is a, a very, it's a very unique space. There's not many people who do what he did. No, it's yeah. a small community. I envy but, you yeah. trying to come up with a segue to business, and I think we just need to have him back. Okay, so <laughs> we just we keep, we keep rolling on this, and then we'll talk. All right, about we'll keep business. rolling on this. Are you okay with that, Andy? All right, uh, yeah, and I'll bring the bourbon next time. All right, Ooh. we're gonna keep rolling on this. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Small Business Safari. Don't forget to go out and rate, review, and follow me. And if you like this episode, go out and check out my other episodes, or check out my Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn for other great content. And remember, your positive attitude will help you achieve your higher altitude in the wild world of small business ownership. Until next time, make it a great day, Adventure Team.